I'm going to go ahead and jump on into it because it's not a super short chapter. Let me do screen share here. Thank you for turning on your cameras. I appreciate that. All right, we got the PowerPoint. Thumbs up, okay. All right, so we're gonna jump right on into it, talk about people with developmental disabilities. This is a group that um, theoretically is, is challenging, but it was a group that I worked directly with for almost 20 years, you know, and I talked to you guys every almost every class I use a North Mississippi Regional Center example, you know, because that's where I worked for 19 and a half years. So I have a lot of things that I did while I was there and a lot of specific examples and things. So this chapter is an interesting one to me. Um, hopefully it will be the same for you guys. <clears throat> so first thing that we need to know as far as, and, and this is, uh, this seems like a testable item here at the beginning, right off the bat. The definition of developmental disabilities. And in order for something to be classified as a developmental disability, it's going to be a lifelong impairment. It will occur before adulthood, which they define here as age 22. And it's going to affect multiple aspects of life in a you know, as in making it things a challenge. And, <clears throat> excuse me, there's some different types that are listed here, and we'll talk about most of these as we go through the chapter. Um, there's a national blueprint that's been put together. It talks about it in the book, um, as far as working with people with intellectual impairments. And then Table 9-1 has a good, uh, has some good examples of legislation and things that have been put forth to help people with de developmental disabilities. So, uh, you know, developmental disabilities, we're talking about people who are vulnerable and they need, um, they're going to need advocacy and they need program availability and they're not going to be out searching these things out on their own. So that's the reason why we have things such as legislature stepping in to help this happen. All right, so understanding the developmental process. Let's see if this stays on this same. Okay, did it pull up? Let me pause it. Did it pull up a YouTube video right then? Or did it jump? No, it didn't. Down? Okay, I'm going to screen share again to a different page. Let me get back where we were. So, now, got it now? It's there. All right, here we go. I got a few little videos in here that are pretty good that I want to share with you guys. It is both unjust and tragic that people with intellectual and developmental differences all over the world receive substandard health care. In community after community and country after country, we have seen the toll of health care injustice. This video is our effort to amplify the voices of people with intellectual and developmental differences, amplify the voices that ask for fairness, for care, for equality, for justice from their healthcare practitioners and all those who support them. We hope that in doing this, 
that the needs of people with intellectual and developmental differences will be seen not as burdens, but as gifts. Gifts to be recognized and treated and cared for by every healthcare practitioner in the world. Athletes with disabilities are just like everyone else. They just want to be treated fairly and respectfully. Get to know me. Get to know me. Try to get to know them first and try to see what their health issue is. If you can understand their health issue at first, then you get to have a first-hand perspective of how they're feeling physically. Treat me like the other patient. Look at me. Look at me. Talk to them person to person. Treat them like an adult, not like, not like a young person, like a young kid. Talk to me and not my mom. I can speak for myself. I can make choices about my health. Don't be afraid to work with people like us. We're more in life than we are different. They're just like any other patient. They have health problems, discomfort problems. It just may take a little bit longer to listen to what they have to say. If our athletes aren't healthy, they can't perform well. They can't go to practices. They can't compete well. They're not well. So healthy athletes has become a very important program, I think, to so many of the athletes. And it gives them another way to connect with professionals that are outside their realm. You can look in the Special Olympics stories and you'll find ones where some dentists have found mouth cancer in kids that have never been to a dentist. You know, like it's a great way to go out and be a provider and maybe catch something that's never been caught before on some of these individuals. It is important to be healthy so that I can do the sport that I love. It's important to be healthy because you feel good about yourself. The same reason for everyone else to be healthy so that you can be the best version that you can be. I want to be as healthy as I can be. When you're asked to treat someone with a disability, you say yes. You say yes. You say yes. You say yes. Say yes. And mean it. All right. Any. I thought that was a pretty good video. It gives a, it gives us a good reminder that when you're working with people with disabilities, you know, it's like some of them were saying like, um, make sure to talk to me, not to my mom. You know, that girl kind of tickled me when I watched it. She, um, <clears throat> but it's true. You know, sometimes people will talk to family members and things and not so much to the patients themselves when you're talking about people with disabilities. So that's just a reminder of how it's important. Um, I helped with national games with Special Olympics three times. I was the Mississippi golf coach twice and aquatics coach once at national games. And they do like they showed where they were checking their feet and checking vision and things like that. Dennis, some of the um, athletes that went with us, they, they have a thing there called healthy athletes. <clears throat> and you just go visit and, and there's uh, doctors and dentists and audiologists. And, you know, you, you may find out some things like, well, the reason that Tom doesn't seem to be listening is because he can't hear that well. And we didn't know that before we went to Special Olympics and saw you know, and they saw an audiologist and found this out. So it's a good program. That was just something that kind of, to me, was a reminder uh, for all of us to treat them like normal people rather than someone who has a disability. So I'm going to share my screen again back to the PowerPoint. I'll have to do that little switch back and forth a few times. Um, there's different domains that you need to look at when you're identifying and examining the, uh, someone with developmental disabilities. You're going to look at physical side, the cognitive side, and socio-emotional sides. You know, how do they work with other people? How do they, you know, how are their emotions held in check and things like that? Um, table 9-2 has a typical developmental process in the book. Um, one thing that we need to do with people with developmental delays is that we need to realize that not every
function. Not everything is delayed. And a lot of times they'll ex excel in other areas. Okay, like I know a lot of you have seen Rain Man. You know, we're talking about someone there who was um, not, a, not, I don't remember if there was a specific diagnosis on there, but he had something along the lines of autism or Asperger's, you know, and he's the a whiz on math and cards and he can remember things. Um, we had clients at the regional center that um, couldn't, couldn't talk. They were nonverbal, uh, couldn't read, but you could turn on a radio when they went to music class and there was one particular client. If there was a song playing on the radio, he would sit down in front of the uh, piano and play the music that went along with the song. So total, just he can hear it and play it. Now I I couldn't sit down and do that. I don't I don't think many of you could sit down and just start playing every song that came on a radio. So it's pretty amazing some of the things that they can do. One of the clients, uh, when I first started working, somebody told me that he had this gift of remembering things like birthdays was his big thing, and. I told him when uh, he asked me when my birthday was and I told him and didn't think much about it. A few days later, I saw him. He asked me what year I was born. I didn't think much about that. Then some time went by. Now he's not going back and doing, uh, looking at a calendar or anything. Um, somebody said, ask him about your birthday again and see if he remembers because he sees tons of people every day. So I asked him my birthday. He named my birthday. He told me the year. He told me what day I was born on, which was freaky and, and kind of cool at the same time. And it ended up, you know, I went back and looked, obviously, to check and see if that was correct. And he was right. And um, I haven't seen him in several years now. I guarantee you, if I went back out there and ran into this client, and asked him when my birthday is, he, he could tell me. He could tell me the day, he could tell me, it, that's, that's his thing, that where he just excels. And it's strange how, you know, it's like when people say that people that are blind, they can hear very well a lot of times, you know, other senses are enhanced. So when they have developmental delays, certain areas sometimes are, very excelled you know they excel in certain areas very much so just interesting things that i've seen firsthand so as far as developmental disabilities the largest subclass of this is are people with intellectual impairment and it says here that one to three percent of the u.s population has some intellectual impairment um, I think that number is probably a little low. I think some people go undiagnosed as far as being on the very mild end of this. You know, if they're functional, they probably haven't had an IQ test or been tested. Um, they need diagnosis based on what we said a few slides ago, you know, being it had to begin before age 22, it's got to affect certain areas of life. Um, they do diagnosis to make sure that someone is intellectually impaired. And once that's the case, then they can be eligible for services. A lot of times they have other developmental disabilities like the ones we'll talk about soon, um, not just intellectual impairment. You know, you see a lot of, um, you would have intellectual impairment and Down syndrome, you know, or, or just your common, thing that would come to mind. Um, a lot of the clients with Down syndrome at the, at the center, they were very sharp, very smart, but as far as um, an IQ test and, and they were in probably the mild range of um, intellectual impairment. So some things that we can work on with, with clients who have intellectual impairment, communication, you know, that could be by working with them in groups, self-care, things that they can do to take better care of themselves, 
things that they can use at home for everyday skills, um, social and interpersonal skills. That's a big thing in recreation therapy is a lot of times they get time to interact with their peers in a social environment that they don't normally get. So that's a plus. Um, we teach them about community resources that are available and how to use those, you know, especially if they live in a group home or live in the community somewhere, they may need some help with, with what community resources are available. Help them with self-direction. And in that, that being said, you know, partially is done through uh, us helping them to get confidence, you know, that they can make choices, give them the opportunity to make choices like uh, that runs right back into that least restrictive environment. You want them to have as much direction and choice as possible so they can excel. Um, functional academic skills, the thing that comes to mind for that would be, you know, counting money, where if they went to the store and needed to buy something, they could actually make a purchase with cash and get change and or count out coins and something that they may not know how to do. Um, a lot of times uh, facilities provide opportunities for work. There's also um, provide leisure and we teach them about leisure, things that they can do like we talked about already. And sometimes we help with health and safety, you know, of individuals with intellectual impairment. They may need some guidance on you know, whether it's even crossing a road, you know, if they're fairly uh, affected by their intellectual impairment, you know, we might have to, when we go on trips and things, we might get them to start remembering that, hey, you got to look both ways before you cross the road. You think of that as being something that you would do with children, but with people with intellectual impairment, their mental age is not going to equate to their actual chronological age. So that's something just to kind of remember. <clears throat> There's a lot of different places that serve people with intellectual disabilities. Um, I worked with the Park Commission here in town for a couple years, and we did have programs for people with intellectual disabilities. There's also um, places that have year-round programs, kind of like, uh, it sounds bad, but kind of like adult daycare where they are there, they're around their peers, they are given activities, maybe work that they can do, things to work on to help better themselves. And there's also things like after-school workshop enrichment programs. Um, something that's important is the, uh, availability of inclusive recreation services and the thing listed right there below it we've talked about it everyone should know this by now least restrictive environment very important that we give them their least restrictive environment and let them be as independent as possible uh, we also want to maximize involvement in general programs which is the definition of inclusion you know where they're not segregated uh, you want them to be able to participate in general programs when possible. Um, there's also private agencies that work with these individuals that are community-based, things that uh, deal with work training and support, help them find employment, socialization opportunities, such as, you know, maybe we at the regional center, we did a prom every year where they had an opportunity to dress up. We had a DJ come in. We decorated with balloons, all of these things. So they're getting socialization opportunities and they're getting support on the things that they need to be successful. And then there's also uh, long-term residential agencies, which would be what the NMRC was when I worked there. It's a, those clients that are served at the NMRC, they live there. 24 7 365 <clears throat> that is their home and there's everything out there except for a walmart probably there's a pharmacy there is nutrition there's everything that they could need is there so these residential agencies 
have really changed a lot. They're not what it used to be. When you think about residential agencies, it used to be an asylum or an institution, and, and it still may be called that in a lot of these cases, but the clients aren't, it's, it's much different these days. It's not, they're not treated in the way that they were a hundred years ago, all locked in a room with one staff watching everybody just sit around and do their own thing. <clears throat> so as far as intellectual impairment, we talked about already that it's the most common form of developmental disability. Uh, some causes of it are genetic conditions, obviously, and, and some things that could happen um, during pregnancy, birth, or childhood events, injuries, things like that. Uh, we had a client at the regional center that actually tried to hang himself and lived and had a lot of brain damage from his attempt at suicide he ended up at the regional center. It was a sad situation, but at least he was able to go somewhere where he could be served and have as much, you know, potential to move forward as he could. So as far as therapeutic recreation in childhood, we're looking to build on what's already being given through educational services. And in a lot of ways, you know, at school, they get recess and things like that. But therapeutic recreation for children, we want to provide socialization. That's important for them learning how to act appropriately with their peers. You know, um, if, you, if you're playing kickball and the ball's kicked to you and you miss it, you don't want to throw a fit and... and you know, things like that, that you learn through socializing with others and putting them in situations helps them to learn. Um, also talk about as they get older, start looking at vocational things, work, you know, what would they like to do um, socially? What are the things that they're interested in? And, and working on some things with cognitive development as they get older as well. Um, now, a lot of these services that we just talked about right there would be under the title of leisure education because you're educating on all of these things like social skills, leisure awareness, you know, what's there to do, how do I do it, um, appropriate use of leisure resources, and activity skill development where we talked about how you figure out the steps in different therapeutic activities that you break down and you work on helping them to learn the skills to be able to put it all together to participate in certain events. Um, a lot of things that you do with people that are intellectually impaired, it really does follow some of the psychology uh, based learning that, that's listed at the bottom where you're talking about behavior modification, such as chaining, shaping, fading, prompting, uh, different ways of helping them to behave appropriately by showing them what to do, by helping them as much as you need to and then slowly backing away the amount of health, help that you're giving them. That would be an example of like fading and, and least restrictive environment at the same time. All right, the uh, first one we'll talk about in specific here is Down syndrome. Their Down syndrome is kind of the poster child for developmental disabilities. To me, you know, that's the one that you always picture when you think of someone that's developmentally delayed. It's the most common chromosomal developmental disability. Um, it's a group of symptoms or abnormalities. It's considered a syndrome. And what happens is there's extra, there's an extra chromosome that's pot, that is there during cell development. And the symptoms are poor muscle tone, hyperflexibility, which means that they are more flexible than they should be in most cases. Uh, they have a lowered resistance to infection. Visual problems are common. Slower physical and mental development. And premature aging as an adult. 
you know, so a 40 year old person with Down syndrome is going to appear to be older than that. All right, I'm gonna click this and then stop share and share screen again, back to here. All right, and here's a video, it's four minutes long about down we syndrome. Ford Super Duty, the most capable heavy duty pickup ever. Should we be able to Ford skip F this in a minute, I hope. 375 no. horsepower and Ranger with the terrain management system. Because of this, you made Ford America's best selling brand. I didn't know that I was going to be able to love her the way that I do. I thought that I would always look at her like she had a defect, and I don't. Um, and it was a real lesson. For me, I'm Maggie Reardon. I'm a senior writer for CNET News, and I have an 18-month-old daughter named Margot who was born with Down syndrome. So I found out that Margot's diagnosis prenatally. I was 39 when I was pregnant, and so I was considered advanced maternal age. And they offered me a blood test that would tell me um, it would basically count the chromosomes um, for the baby. This is a whole new era. It's being offered to a lot of women. Um, I took the test, not because I was concerned about any sort of genetic issue, but I just wanted to find out if she was going to be a girl or a boy. When I found out that she had Down syndrome, I was devastated. Um, I remember I was sitting on my couch, I got the phone call, and I just, I just cried. Um, this wasn't what I expected. This wasn't, you know, when you get pregnant, you have all these visions of of what your life is going to be like, what your child is going to be like. Is she going to look like me? Is she going to, you know, read Judy Bloom like I did? Is she, uh, is she going to have a sense of humor? Um, and then you get news like this, and I thought, all that's gone. She's not going to do any of those things. She's not going to look like me. She's not, um, you know, am I going to be able to love this child? Um, I'm going to have to take care of her for the rest of my life, uh, you know. And when you're first pregnant. Um, it's just a shock to know you're going to have to take care of somebody for 18 years. But then when you think about, you know, you're going to take care of them forever. Um, it was scary. It was scary. Things are changing so drastically for people with Down syndrome. You know, like I was born in, in the early 70s and it's, it's just, it's vastly different, right? I mean, kids now go to school um, together. It's very likely that she's going to be in a typical classroom with typical peers and that these kids will be her friends. And, and I'm really confident that that's going to happen. Um, I know it's going to take some work on our part, um, but that's okay because she's worth it. You know, they're just kids, you know, and they're going to have some challenges. I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. People with Down syndrome tend to have low muscle tone. Um, now, what we've found out and, and what research now knows is that if you, if you do a lot of physical therapy, particularly early on, you know, you start right away, you can train those muscles, um, so it makes a big difference. Baby went to eat with her spoon, okay, baby. One of the services that Margot receives is um, speech feeding therapy. Just like you would train your muscles uh, so that you could run a marathon, well, we have to train Margot's muscles to be able to learn how to eat and learn how to, to speak. Um, and it's really interesting that the same muscles that you use to eat as an infant, and those as those things develop. Um, they're the same muscles that they use in their mouth um, to make sounds and to, to talk. Margot practices chewing on her chewy tube and um, moving her tongue around. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of progress. Just like, uh, you know, a mother bird with her baby bird, you know, you've got to prepare them to, to leave the nest at some point. And, and even for children who have disabilities and challenges, you know, you have to figure out a way um, and give her some independence. And I also think that just people want independence. She's gonna want that. You know, I want her to have all those things. You know, I don't care if she goes to Harvard. There's a lot of, a lot of bumps in the road that come with parenting any child, right? And so what Mark and I had to learn, my husband and I had to learn early on is you, know, you can't, you don't know. You don't know what you're gonna get. Uh, anything can happen um, when you're raising a child. And you know, we're just gonna love her and try to, give her 
the best that we can so that she is the best she can be. And that's all we can do. I'm Hector. I am a delivery operations manager in San Diego, California. Okay, another good um, video that's talking about, you know, something that they brought up that's important that has grown through time is, is early intervention. And that's important. And, you know, she talked about how if you had um, work, worked with the children early, that you can, you can make strides. And it's important to have that early intervention. It helps a great deal with making them, uh, you can make a lot of progress at a young age, whereas if you waited a little longer, it wouldn't be as efficient. All right, let me share back to the PowerPoint. Okay, the next one we'll talk about, and the reason that I included these videos, y'all, is because I wanted you to actually have a visual representation, you know, of kind of what you're looking at with each one. It's easier for you to see it. And actually, you know, if you're out in public and you see someone, you may be able to tell what's, you know, what exactly is, is going on with, with a particular person that you may not have been able to from not laying eyes on them before. Um, Fragile X, We'll talk about it. It's the most common inherited form of intellectual impairment. That's important that it's inherited and the most common one of those. So make a note of that. It's more severe in males. That's also something to note. So one in 3,847 people have the fragile X mutation. And what causes it, as far as fragile X, is your body does not produce enough protein for development. That's, that's where the problem lies. So several things to remember real quick. It's an inherited form, the most common inherited form, more severe in males, and it's caused by insufficient protein for development. So know those things. And you're going to see things like intellectual impairment, sensitivity to sensation. So, you know, vibration that you or I may not even feel might set someone off who has fragile X. Um, if you have a light that's flickering a little bit above you or something, that may totally get their attention and you wouldn't even really pick up on it or notice it. They have behavioral problems similar to autism and they have some unique physical characteristics. And so I'm gonna stop again and, and, and get this going. Annie, uh, did you burp? All right. This is two brothers, if I remember. It's only 49 seconds, but we're talking about Fragile X, and the, this is a good example. Annie, uh, did you burp? I did burp. Who burped? Oh, yeah. Oh, it her. Uh, Who was it? Who was you? Who oh, you? Are you positive? Enjoy. Are you positive? Who oh, you? Who oh, you? Was you? Was you? Nope. Yeah. Ow. Oh, my head. Oh, short um, but an example of fragile X back to PowerPoint all right PKU phenylketonuria is another 
type of developmental disability. It's inherited as well. It's a metabolic disorder. What's important about it is that the body can't break down the protein phenylalanine. Be able to recognize that. It can cause brain damage and be aware of, it's important to be aware of medical history during pregnancy. It's, it's seen in one in 14,000 births and the treatment for this is just a change in diet, which is going to limit the intake of that specific protein, phenylalanine. Back to another video. And this just tells a little bit about it. Remember the disorder phenylketonuria, or PKU, by the phoenix with ketone key. This condition is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder shown by the recessive chocolate. The molecular depiction of enzymes broken represents that this condition is caused by an enzyme deficiency in the metabolism of phenylalanine. Assessment findings in infants with PKU may include failure to thrive, shown by the very skinny baby. Irritability, depicted as the irritated baby, is often noted and behavioral, emotional, and social problems may emerge as the child grows into adulthood. Excessive amounts of phenylalanine cause the patient to have a musty or mousy odor, shown by the mustache mice with odor. Additionally, since the PKU patient lacks the enzyme required to metabolize phenylalanine, the accumulation of the amino acid may lead to cognitive impairment, the COGS impaired. Treatment for PKU involves maintaining a low phenylalanine diet, shown by the down arrow Phoenix Aladdin with nutritional plate. This includes consuming low protein foods, illustrated as down arrow Mr. Protein, as natural sources of dietary protein contain high amounts of phenylalanine and thus cannot be metabolized. Patients must also avoid aspartame, shown by the avoid sign as sweetener, as digested aspartame releases phenylalanine into the bloodstream. In combination with the PKU diet, the medication saproproterin, shown by the soap rope, may be taken to increase tolerance of phenylalanine ingestion. This drug is also known by its trade name, Cuvair. Immediate detection and intervention of PKU is critical for preventing major health problems. The Guthrie blood test, shown by the Guthrie Gravy blood test, is a newborn screening tool performed as a heel stick after the infant is 24 hours old and has ingested dietary protein. So let's review phenylketonuria, or PKU. It is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder characterized by the deficiency of an enzyme necessary for phenylalanine metabolism. Patients may present with failure to thrive, irritability, a musty or mousy odor, and cognitive impairment. Treatment includes maintaining a low phenylalanine diet by avoiding foods containing protein or aspartame. In combination with the PKU diet, the medication saproproterin, or Cuvan, may help improve tolerance of phenylalanine ingestion. The Guthrie blood test is a newborn screening tool critical in diagnosing PKU. All right. That was a. That was a goofy video. Um, I don't think I could handle a whole lot of those, but uh, it, I actually kind of see their point and that you probably will remember some of that. Like you'll probably remember and you, and you need to remember that one of the things that comes along with PKU is the mousy odor. It's a certain scent that they actually put off, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, you'll remember that the children fail to thrive. So I, I don't know. It was an interesting video to a degree. It was very different from a lot of the different ones. Question. Yes. Um. So it said they can't, like, digest protein. Does that mean they're not going to be able to, like, produce much muscle mass? Like, they're, are they going to be, like, a very small person? They're, they're most, in most cases, they, they're not going to be as big as as normal correct mm -hmm. you know they're not gonna grow up and 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 get super muscular but gotcha. you know they can that they have a you know it's that specific type of protein that is that is the main problem for them so if they can eat some other you know they can do other 
types of protein. They can, I mean, they're not going to be super frail and stick thin, but they're going to be, you know, uh, limited on protein. And they'll, if they're on the correct kind of diet, they'll be watching that. And that probably would keep them a little smaller than the average person. But yeah, that, that was a good thing to, to notice from that. Good question. Okay, autism. Everybody knows about autism. We've heard about this one. Um, it's a pervasive developmental disorder. It's the most common form of pervasive developmental disorder. It's a neurological disorder. It affects things like communication, understanding, play, socialization. Um, some of the symptoms that you see, you know, well, back up. It says, affects communication, understanding, play, and socialization. The first thing that comes to mind is a lot of people that are dealing with autism, they don't really want to socialize in a lot of cases. You know, um, that's something that they look for in children. You know, it's the, you've got five kids over here fighting over a toy and playing together, and then you've got one that's just sitting over by himself. That's kind of a red flag. You know, because kids are going to be drawn to other children most of the time. Um, so socialization is a lot of times not seen unless it's almost forced. There's a lack of social or emotional reciprocity where like if you smile at your baby and, hey, how you doing? They may not smile back and say it back. So uh, they don't necessarily give that back to you. A lot of times you'll see stereotyped or repetitive motions. It may just be kind of rocking back and forth or flicking one finger. I mean, it, there's a lot of different motions that, that you will see, and that's just self-stimulation. They're trying, it's, they don't even think about what they're doing. They don't really participate in spontaneous make-believe play. Um, and you have to be very, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, well, like you, you wouldn't want to use the sentence that, well, it's hot as hell outside today. They're going to actually think that hell is outside. They take things very, you know, exactly the way you say it. Literal. Literally. There you go. That, I'm, I'm at that loss of word too. They take I got you. Super literally. So you can't use the <laughs> words that... The, you know, they, they'll, they'll take it exactly the way it comes out of you. It is seen in one in a, every 150 children, four times more common in boys than girls. Big difference there. Three out of four people uh, with autism also have intellectual impairment. And in, in half of those, um, it's moderate to severe. Seizures are seen in 25 to 33% of people who have autism. Um, another thing that I've seen personally with autism, a lot of times they don't have the uh, fear response that you may have. They don't think about certain things like uh, just because John can't swim doesn't mean that John isn't going to walk up and jump in the deep end. Or doesn't John may not think about climbing up this big tall tower with no uh, no rope or anything for safety no safety equipment so that's something else that I've seen is they don't really have that uh, healthy fear that you should have of certain things the main thing is that they really don't show a lot of emotion don't necessarily want to interact a whole lot now the, the guy that I was talking about about my birthday earlier he um, you know, when you're talking to him, he's kind of like look, looking down. He won't give you that eye contact that you normally would get from people. He'll interact with you, but you can tell it's kind of almost hurting him to do it. It seems like, you know, he wants to talk to you, but at the same time, he's just uncomfortable. You can just see it. And that's something that you see with people who are, who've been diagnosed with autism. Okay. Another video. Oh. <laughs> 
It's a minute and a half long. I didn't hit you with super long ones or anything. Tried to do things that you could actually remember. It's a developmental spectrum disorder. Autism is made up of a constellation of symptoms, including difficulty with communication, social interaction, and compulsive behaviors. They also have uh, what we call stereotypic behaviors. One of them might be spinning in place or hand flapping. Child psychiatrist Dr. Denise Duchik says symptoms can start in early childhood as young as two years old. Parents and pediatricians will recognize it early on, even before two years of age, uh, depending on how they're communicating and how they're interacting. While autism is a lifelong condition, treatments are available to help children with their speech, language, cognitive development, and social skills. They can learn social skills. They can learn to communicate as, as well as anybody. Um, they can you know, become involved in jobs. They can have families. And they can you know, function in the mainstream. Doctors say for the treatment to be beneficial, it has to be coordinated with the school and home. It's essential that uh, they're getting all the help that they need in school because they may learn differently. They have, a lot of them may have language impairments, so they definitely need their speech and language therapies. The earlier therapy begins, the more overall benefits for the child. Forley Health, I'm Lindsay Fry. Uh, okay, again, um, they brought it up another time of how important it is to get that early intervention. It's absolute key with people who are dealing with autism. That early intervention makes a big difference in how they adjust moving forward. So if we're working with people in therapeutic recreation that have autism or other pervasive developmental disabilities, we're gonna focus on improving their communication, their social skills, academic things we can work on, behavioral, you know, uh, learning appropriate behavior and what is inappropriate, daily living skills. Um, a lot of times there are things uh, that you can do, you can let them have experiences with different types of sensory inputs. They have sensory rooms for people with, with autism. Um, there's a something that's interesting to me, you know, they have something that they're selling these days that a lot of people buy and then we're not talking about people with autism uh, like weighted blankets people like the feel of the weighted blanket it's kind of a comforting sort of thing they have a deal for people with autism that they actually get into it and it wraps up like a cocoon and squeezes and that's a feeling that a lot of people with autism like that's something that they kind of crave but they're getting it from an inanimate object if you went up and just tried to give them a big squeezy hug it would not be as uh, pleasant for them just something that i've from knowing and working with them i know that that's the case interaction with peers without disabilities is important for them moving forward you know showing them how that they can live as they grow older. Uh, they have different programs that are found in various places in schools. A lot of times they are in normal classrooms. A lot of times there may not be a large amount of developmental, uh, of intellectual delay. You know, it may just, it may more manifest as far as how they function speaking to other people and giving eye contact and things like that. Um, a therapist is going to need to assess, like we talked about, is API, assessment, planning, implementation, evaluation. You got to assess up front, and when you're doing that, you're identifying what their needs are and what their strengths are or their abilities are. And there's also relaxation rooms that reduce sensory overload. Autism is a good example, again, of if you're sitting in a room with a fluorescent light that has that little flicker in it, you're gonna eventually become kind of immune to that. They're not. They're not gonna hear a word you're saying because they're just, that's all they're seeing. 
a lot of times. Now, that's not the case for everyone who has autism, but as far as uh, sensory things, some of them are very big triggers for certain people. Cerebral palsy is the next. We're getting there. This is good information, so y'all just hang in there with me. Another four minute video. Christine was born at 12.05 on the 4th of July. She was 14 inches long, two pounds, three ounces, which is a couple months Hi. early and very, very teeny. Looking back, I think I was very numb to everything that was going on, just knowing that something was wrong and we had to hurry. When Christina was about a month old, um, they pulled us into the room to tell her, uh, to tell us that hey. she had. <laughs> <laughs> this is the stuff that's hard for daddy. <laughs> uh, paraventricular leukomalacia. It's a uh, death of the white matter. And the doctor <laughs> didn't try to sugarcoat anything and um, <laughs> told us that she would probably be a vegetable. Christina got the cerebral palsy diagnosis uh, about a year after, after she was born. I guess that would be when they decided that I'll do whatever I can to make life the best for her. The first day of rehab, they had asked her to bend her legs and that had, if Christina could do that, that was never easy for her. Are you smiling? Listening to them ask her to do that was, <laughs> um, I knew what the results were going to be. However, I was mistaken. And she bent her legs up individually, the, the legs that they had asked her to, uh, with some difficulty. But she was able to do that the first, the first day of therapy, after the surgery, seeing that. Um, made everything worthwhile. There's days she's so worn out because she's worked so hard that you can see her just struggle to take the steps and she doesn't want to quit. She wants to keep going. To have that drive. I wish I had that. Mm -hmm. We're working on it. We've had wonderful doctors. We've had wonderful nurses. You expect that. That's what you want. There's everybody else that, that made it holy. Um, one of the uh, one of the staff brought in flowers from her garden. It was beautiful. You know, it's little things like that that you know. I like to think that Christina made an impact and me. <laughs> that you know that we were able to to uh, change their lives as they changed ours. Christina loves to be moving. Um, she she's always been a <laughs> a mover and a shaker. We go for a, a wagon ride every night, regardless of the weather. Even in the winter time, what does a parent do? They bundle the kid up so they look like a big old snowman, and you go for a walk. Here we. As long as I'm able, I will make sure that she can move around um, and quickly. Yeah, because that's what she wants to do. Yeah, you're my hero. I like that one a lot. Um, you could see a lot of change in the dad, you know, from what he expected up front. And, and you know, now she's as, you know, he, he thought it was going to be something that he couldn't handle and something that was, you know, how, how are we going to move on with this diagnosis? And then by the end, you know, she's his hero. 
And and while we're talking, what about that machine that she was in? That was some some cool stuff that was helping to work on that walking. That is some things that weren't available, you know, probably 30 years ago. That that looked like some new sort of technology right there. And that's and you could see that she, you know, she will get to the point where she can walk with, you know, as long as she has her assistance with her. So yes, there are challenges and things like that with all of these situations, but um, there's also light at the end of the tunnel that I like to see. Um, let's see where we are on the slideshow here. All right, cerebral palsy, which we just watched that video about. It's a group of disorders where there's an inability to control muscular and postural movements due to brain damage that happens before age 12. Uh, the causes are gonna be genetic conditions, certain infections. It could come from child abuse or stroke or a head injury, which could even happen during birth. Sometimes there are head injuries during birth during the birthing process. We'll run through these types of cerebral palsy. There's different types. Spastic is the most common form, which is uh, you see a lot of, when you think spastic is spasticity, very, very tight muscles. Arms and legs are gonna be drawn up just super tight stiff cannot like to the point where they can't straighten their arms they're drawn in tight all the time and when i worked at the regional center i was over the uh, aquatic i did aquatic therapy with the patients there one of my favorite things to do was to get our clients that had cerebral palsy and get them in our therapy pool which we kept around 92 degrees not sure if y'all are aware of what pools normally are 92 degrees is is downright hot for a pool. But it was excellent for therapeutic reasons. Um, it helped to reduce some of this stiffness. Uh, most of the clients we had that had cerebral palsy, they were in wheelchairs full time. If they weren't in their wheel wheelchair, they were in a bed. Or they were sitting, you know, they might take them out of their wheelchair and put them in a recliner or something in the cottage. But the thing that I loved about it was I was able to get them in the water, in the pool, have them floating in the water. They had absolutely no pressure points on them at that point. Um, they weren't sitting on anything. They weren't laying on anything. Their body was actually free and they didn't have that pressure on them that they had 24 hours a day otherwise. I also would see big differences. During the time I had them in there, I would just, kind of help them relax and do a little bit of light stretching on legs and arms. And by the time they got out of the pool, you could see a big difference in how, in how much spasticity they had. Big difference. And it would last, if I saw them the next day, it would still be there a lot of times, that improvement. So that was awesome to me. And I got the most, that was one of the most, one of my favorite things that I did for sure because I could see a difference and I could see them feeling better when they left. And you could tell that they loved the fact that they didn't, you know, they could also, some of them, they could walk with me in the pool. If I'm holding their hands, they've got the buoyancy of the water and they were able to walk along with me, which is something that obviously they couldn't do on dry land. So water is a very good tool. Um, that was one of my best things that I did when I was there. There's three forms of your spastic cerebral palsy. Diplegia, where only the legs are affected. Hemiplegia, half the body is affected, one side or the other. And then quadriplegia, which both arms and legs are affected. So know the difference in those. Diplegia is just the legs. Another type of cerebral palsy is athetoid where they're gonna actually have low muscle tone, which is just the opposite of this spasticity we were talking about in the spastic one. Um, athetoid cerebral palsy, very slow 
uncontrollable movements of the entire body. You know, like if they're, if they were going to pick up a cup off a table, they would move slow and they would probably still knock the cup over. I mean, I'm not, that's just a good example of kind of how they're, even though they move slow and it looks like they're going to be accurate with what they're trying to do. Um, a lot of times that's not the case. Another type of cerebral palsy is ataxic. Know the difference in these three, make a note of that. Ataxic cerebral palsy, they have a, a poor sense of balance and trouble controlling uh, muscular length or position. So again, like I talked about with the cup, they may overshoot when they're reaching for an object. And then there's mixed cerebral palsy, which is a combination of kind of all the above. Let me look at where we are here. We're probably going to tell you what, let's call it a day. That was a good solid hour. I think that was enough for today. And we'll jump back in. Before I turn this off, I'm going to make a note on my sheet here of which when we stop that, not in a huge rush because this chapter and the next chapter are pretty important. And what I hope, and I know that this working with this population is not for everybody, but I hope for the ones of you that it may be for, you know, that it's that you learn a lot in these couple chapters and it might show you some that some of your preconceptions may not necessarily be the case um, that's a big part of this chapter and the next chapter for me so i'm going to stop sharing here and we'll go back into this chapter next class and hope you guys are doing well and i will um See you guys next class. We'll jump right back in where we left off. We'll finish chapter nine and probably go ahead and get into chapter 10. But if we run in late, I'll just quit like we are. I think an hour is about long enough for today. So you guys- Are we still good with talking for a few minutes after yeah. class? Okay. Yeah, I got you. So thank you guys and I will see you next time. Have a nice day. All right, you too. See ya.